All right, let's get this started. Welcome everybody to Our Watch with Tim Thompson. Glad you could all join us tonight and everybody watching online. Um, if you are here in the building, um, go ahead and make your way on in and have a seat. We're gonna be getting started here in just a moment. And before we go too much further, would you join me as we pray for tonight's program? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can be here tonight, uh, just having uh, closeness here in your house uh, to be able to uh, hear some information uh, that is going to be just beneficial to our worldview and, and the way that we can be involved, uh, applying our faith, and uh, those of us with a Judeo-Christian mindset can be doing things and taking action uh, that can just help us to make a difference in the community around us and in all the ways that that plays out in the public square. And so we're so grateful for tonight and for everybody here and everybody watching online. We pray that you would uh, bless the conversation tonight between Pastor Tim and Pastor Don Stewart, uh, that it would be glorifying to you and that this message would reach far and wide and accomplish what you want it to accomplish. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, we are going to be taking an offering. We do that because Our Watch is a nonprofit organization, and so we rely on the partnerships with people who are willing to uh, help out and, uh, and, and sponsor. And if you're able to do that, great. If not, that's okay. Uh, either way, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate all of you who have been supporting Our Watch and uh, this particular program, and so thank you for that. Um, next week, our guest is going to be Esther Valdez Clayton, and she is an immigration attorney and is going to have some uh, good things to talk about. She's also very involved with the uh, school board in San Diego. Uh, also, in the next coming weeks, we've got uh, some great guests for you. We're going to be having Will Witt and Amala from PragerU. Uh, they're going to be joining us here live very soon, as well as some of America's frontline doctors. So stay tuned and uh, be checking out the website and our social media for all those details about who is going to be coming up as guest here on Our Watch. Um, if you go to ourwatchnow.com, it would be great to sign up for our email list. And when you're on the email list, you'll get notifications by email about different upcoming events and what Our Watch has going on. So make sure you go on there and subscribe. And also on all the different social media outlets, uh, such as YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, go there and give us a like and a follow. And... Yeah, we appreciate that. Um, so like I said, thanks for being here. We're going to be getting started with the program in just a few minutes. So until then, sit back and relax and enjoy our watch. This past year, the radical left with their globalist mindset has burned down our cities, forced businesses to close, and tried to silence our churches. They told us to wear a mask and stay home to save lives, and many Christians remain silent. That is no longer an option. The silent majority will be silent no more, and the sleeping giant has been awakened. We are going to use our voice to take back the media, stop the censorship, and very loudly take back the public square. I'm Tim Thompson, and this is Our Watch. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Our Watch here at Wednesday night. So glad to have you all out here. I want to just say how grateful I am to see so many 
smiling, unmasked faces. You are beautiful and uh, created in the image of God, and I'm glad you are not covering that up. So i um, so glad that you are here, and I just want to say hello to everybody that is tuned in online tonight with us. Glad you're with us here at Our Watch, and I just want to remind each and every single one of you that the reason we come together on a Wednesday night is we want to find out what this book right here has to say about the cultural issues of our day. And I can tell you this, uh, as we seek to, to be effective for God, we, we know that the Lord has been here once, we know He's returning, and we, are, we anticipate His return. But until He gets back, until He comes for, uh, for the church and raptures uh, the church and resurrects the, the, those who have died in Christ uh, from the grave, uh, we're going to occupy until He returns. We're going to be effectively doing those two things that he's called us to be, the salt and the light. The salt preserving the community, the culture, and uh, the light exposing the wickedness that's in the darkness, uh, revealing what is there, and uh, we want to do that to the best of our ability. And so we're definitely going to be continuing to focus in our energies here at Our Watch in some very specific areas. For us, uh, it is definitely the school boards. So we're going to give you an update on our, our weekly updates for the school board draft picks. So let's go ahead and get into it, and I'll give you our updates. So here's where we are for uh, the, the school boards here in Southwest Riverside County. So the first one, uh, I just want to uh, make sure you, you know, and, and we all know this, we've got two seats up in Marietta. Now those two seats, uh, the first one is Oscar Rivas. Does Oscar Rivas stay or does he go? That guy's got to go. Uh, we cannot have him on the school board anymore. Uh, the guy has claimed to be a uh, pro parental rights person, and he has proven to be nothing for, for parental rights at all. So uh, the other seat, there's only two seats up in Marietta. The other one is Chris Tomasian. Does Chris Tomasian stay or does she go? She has got to go. I can tell you that woman does not care about your rights as a parent. I don't care what she says. The way she votes is what's going to end up mattering. We can prove that what she's done is voted to, to advance the LGBTQ plus agenda within the Marietta School District, and she voted against your rights as parents. So we're going to hold those two accountable, and we're going to find people to fill those spots. We have somebody for Chris Tomasian's spot. We are going to have that person come here to our watch and, and announce their campaign. So they're working on that right now. Um, now, here's what you need to know about the rest of the districts here in our area. Temecula has three seats up. We've got um, Adam Skumowitz, we've got Barbara Broche, and we also have Sandy Hinkson. All three of those are up here in 2022. And then if you take a look at Lake Elsinore, we have three seats in Lake Elsinore. Christopher McDonald, Stan Crippen, and Heidi Dodd. All three of those seats are up. And then finally, Menifee School District again has three seats up in 2022. We've got Jackie Johansson, we've got Kyle Root, and we've got Morgan Singleton. So let me tell you about those. Temecula, Lake Elsinore, and Menifee. Here's where we're at with those, because we already know Marietta's got to go. We're going to be taking care of that, um, and, and we're going to be coming out real strong for parental rights here in Marietta. But for the rest of those, we, you know, Temecula, Lake Elsinore, Menifee, here's where we're at with that. We do have the consultant, the political consultant. We put together a team of people who are going to be a part of an interview process, and this week, Letters are going out to each and every one of those school board members that we just mentioned. And the letter is going to um, have a form that they're, we're going to request them to fill out. And that form is a questionnaire, so we're going to find out what they think about the topics that matter most to us. And then we're going to invite them to come out to be interviewed by our panel of people. We've got, um, we've got a homeschool parent. Uh, we've got a parent of kids in public school. We've got... Um, retired and uh, current teachers. And of course, we've got myself will be on that panel, our political consultant will be on that panel, and then Desiree Ferraro, who is the public relations person for our watch. Um, we will all sit on a panel and, and interview and ask all these hard questions. And then um, we will determine, are these people somebody we can get behind or not? 
And once we do that, we will present to you the ones we say have passed that test and the ones that haven't passed the test, well, we're just not going to move forward with them at all. I can tell you this, um, we're, we're looking at their, how they're registered to vote. If they are registered as a Democrat, um, I can tell you right now, if they're registered as a Democrat, I'm just not going to give them the time of day. It's that simple. The, 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 pla the platform for the Democrats is anti-everything that we care about. So I, I won't even give them the time of day. But here's the fact. There's a lot of Republicans and other uh, part, you know, members of other parties that, that say that they're Republican. They say that they're for your parental rights, but they say they're Christian. But the fact is they've got no backbone. They, they're not standing for your rights. So I don't care if they're registered Republican or not. We have to vet them. We have to make sure that they've got a good voting record and that they're going to do well for our kids and for our grandkids. So that's the update right now. Next week, we'll be able to tell you um, kind of where we're at as far as them getting our, our questionnaire and them, you know, how they're responding to it. And here's the fact. If, if they don't want to fill it out, they don't even care to fill it out or come and be interviewed, then why would we give them any more time? They're done. We, you know, the fact is we need people who are strong and willing to take a stand for our kids and our grandkids. You know, we, we take a look at um, all the things that matter to us, the critical race theory that's being pushed in our school systems right now. Temecula teacher pushing critical race theory on people. And then you got, you know, churches that are pushing critical race theory in the church saying, oh, we, we back up this, this teacher 100%. This is nonsense. Critical race theory is wicked. It's from Satan, and we can't have this pushed in our community. You've got girls that are able to go get abortions. I just got more information today about the wellness centers that the children's hospitals are pushing on our school campuses where kids can get abortions, and um, even some, some of these uh, wellness centers on campus, kids will be able to get transgender therapy without your knowledge or your consent. So these are all things that matter very much to us. And then you look at the transgender ideology that's being pushed and um, you know, the vaccinations that are being pushed, that your kids can't go to a school unless they get these vaccines. This stuff is nonsense, and we need school boards to stand up against it. So that's the update for this week. Next week, we'll tell you where we're at with each and every one of those. So we are going to focus, laser focus our attention on the school boards and uh, those barnacles that have been attached to our school board doing nothing for so long, they've got a rude awakening. So there's that. All right. So our guest this evening, uh, he's an internationally recognized Christian apologist and speaker. He's a best-selling and award-winning author and co-author of uh, over 70 books. And his various writings have been translated into over 30 different languages and have now sold over a million copies. Please welcome to the stage our friend Don Stewart. Don, All right, thank you. So yeah. good to have well, you nice out to be tonight, here. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody here. Yeah, um, I, uh, I'm so humbled to have you up here with me. Um, I, for those of you who don't know, the book that I wrote that came out uh, this year, uh, Don wrote the forward for it. So I'm very blessed to because it was an excellent book. That's why well, I did. Thank it. you. It was thank really you. good. So yeah. Um, yep. it, it's exciting to have you here. We've had you here um, one other time during this COVID season right. on a Wednesday night. We've had you a few times here on Sunday mornings, and um, you, you definitely know the reality of COVID. <laughs> yes, uh, you want to yeah. share a little bit about that for people who might not know? Yeah. Um, again, I also, I always have to thank people for praying for me, because uh, if you don't know what happened, on December 2nd of last year, I was doing, uh, that time, six TV programs a week, one um, radio program, at one time for 23 straight days, I got up in the morning and did something, spoke, did a TV radio program, and I started feeling really lousy, like someone let the air out of me. I thought, this is strange, because I might have thought well, I've been pushing it too much. But then, Tim, when I knew something was wrong, I started having hallucinations. I haven't had a hallucination <laughs> since 1968. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and it was at a Jimi Hendrix concert at the Hollywood Bowl. And so... I knew, I knew something was wrong, and so to make a short story long, what happened was uh, after about five days, uh, my wife took me to the ER, I waited five hours to get in there, and the doctor finally said, uh, yes, sir, you do have the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus, <laughs> and uh, 
And, but they gave me some stuff, sent me home. Five days later, I had to go back because I was even worse. And uh, they put me in the hospital for four days. And according to the doctor's notes, I had one foot in the grave, the other on the banana peel during that time. So the Lord miraculously, there were a lot of miracles happened actually to keep me alive. So thank you for your prayers because everywhere I go, people say, I prayed for you, I prayed for you. Well, your prayers were answered, so I'm very, very thankful. Yeah. So I'm glad to be here tonight. <laughs> well, I've, uh, I've listened to you my, my whole life, and I, I look up to you greatly, and your ministry is incredible, and um, I'm just, I'm humbled that you wrote the forward, um, but I, I've always had a great respect for what you do and, and how you teach, and my respect for you went up even higher, because <laughs> yeah. during that time yeah. that, that he was sick, I was filling in yeah. so you could recover. I, I was I filling that. in every single day at, yeah. hit on his channel, doing the news, and I got to tell you that I don't know how you did that for so long, um, day after day like that. And, you know, I, I was up every morning, 3.30, yeah. trying to know what I'm going to say for that short hour. Um, it's a lot of work to, yeah. to maintain. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it's a lot of work for me. Um, our brains work differently. Um, you, you, you've got a lot more study and, and experience behind you than I do. And um, I got to tell you, just even that, that short time that I was doing that, it really, my experience, I, I felt, wow, I, I can't believe how much I've gained just yeah. in that short time. Yeah, it, it, it'll challenge you, won't it? It'll stretch you a bit. And it was, uh, that was one of the things the Lord showed me I had to quit because I was doing too much. You, when you do a news story like breaking news, it never ends. As soon as you finish a story, you work on the next one. And then, as you probably saw, you get there to the studio, you're, you're going to go on the air in about a half hour, then a couple big stories break, go, okay, now we have to go to plan B. And so that happened a lot of times. But uh, yeah, the Lord's got me doing other things now. I'm doing on my website, educatingourworld.com. We have 61 books, educatingourworld.com for free downloads. I've got five audio books now you can download for free, and that's part of our ministry. And so I'm, I'm getting into writing more books. We've got 30, 34 of them now in print of the 61 that are on there. We're trying to get most of them in print. So we're keeping busy. But yeah. God is good. Yeah. And uh, so far, so good. And you're still doing stuff with his channel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still I'm, but record. taping the programs. Now. Yeah. Nothing live anymore. Yeah. I'm not going to show up live. And that's, yeah. the pressure's off. When you tape something, it's fine, even though you, they do it on one take. But when you're live, you've got to be there at a certain time. And I don't know about you, the traffic going there sometimes was nuts. You get some accident on the 57 freeway, and it takes me an hour to get on a regular 25-minute drive, and I'm there about five minutes before I'm going on the air. So that was, that was not fun either. So I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, well, good. Uh, so for those of you that want to tune in more, um, he's got his programs on his channel, and then also educating our world. Our world. Mm -hmm. com. So um, Again, just happy to have you on tonight. Oh, thanks for asking. And, Glad to be here. Um, I want to talk to you about Israel, of course. Sure. Uh, we want to talk about the rapture tonight. We want okay. to talk about the Gog, Magog invasion. Sure. Uh, lots to talk about. Um, the, the first thing I want to ask you about, there was a New York Times article that came out uh, just recently, and it, it talks about the Middle East. You know, we're talking about Israel and the government that they're trying to push right now. So my question is, yeah. do you think that lawmakers are going to be able to approve this new coalition government? They're, they're talking this Wednesday, there should be, or, I'm sorry, this Sunday, Sunday. there should be a vote. Um, it, so, so kind of a two-part. So do you think they're going to be able to push that through? And if so, what, it, what will this look like? Because I'm, I'm thinking we're going to see, if they do, I think we would see an immediate test by by Iran, yeah, on on how how they're going to handle it, what, how the new leadership will handle it. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, Israel's a parliamentary system. We don't have it here in the U.S. I lived in Australia; they had it there. The U.K. Israel does it. There's 120 seats in their Knesset called the Parliament, and your your party has to get 61 of the seats. The Prime Minister comes from a party that can get at least 61 seats. Now, it's usually a combination of parties. This is the fourth election they've had, and Benjamin Netanyahu has been very close each time with like 59 seats. You need two more, 61, could never get them. 59 this time also. What happened was, again, to make a short story long, the, one of the right parties, it means rightward, it's called Yamina, meaning rightward, Naftali Bennett, who was the leader of that, he got on TV and he signed documents. I would never do a, 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 a 
party coalition with the left. I will never join a government with the left, with the Yair Lapid and these other people. Uh, over and over again said it. Well, guess what? He's going to be the new prime minister of this leftist government. Of the 61 seats, 20 of them are right-wing parties. 41, Tim, come from the center or the left. And it would be an absolute disaster from Israel, because the left in Israel are mostly atheists. They, they have no um, belief in God at all, any way, shape, or form. They're very, very leftist, very, very woke very, very liberal, and they're the ones that are going to be running the thing. So Sunday is going to be the vote. It looks like it's going to be 61 to 59 because Bennett broke all his promises to the people when he said he wouldn't do this, I won't do that, but he's been offered the prime ministership for two years, and it will be an absolute disaster because you're going to have people at loggerheads, you know, in the Security Council. Uh, the, every, they're, they're going two different, it's like riding a horse, two horses going different directions. So, and yes, they will be tested. They're already being tested. Fed Blinken, the Secretary of State, said today, looks like they're going to about have the first test because Iran is, again, sort of saber-rattling again. And so is Hamas down there in the Gaza Strip, you know, that sent all those rockets for those 11 days, the uh, 4,000 rockets. Plus. So, yeah, it's going to be a mess. So, as we say, stay tuned. Because the Bible says, you know, in the last days, Israel will not have a friend in the world. Whatever happens, what happened this last uh, deal with Hamas, um, the whole world was seemingly against Israel. Zechariah 12, 3 says one day the whole world will be against Israel at the time of the end. And they're getting fewer and fewer friends. Unfortunately, here's the heartbreaking thing, unfortunately, including the United States of America right now, where Joe Biden has got a list of Israel haters on his uh, basically on his staff on that he's put in positions of authority uh those who actually are you know hate israel you know they do right. and so we'll wait and see right um you know that's that's a part of this whole critical race theory that's being yes. pushed in the yes. ethnic studies they want here in the state of california yep. and various other states a, a large part of it is anti-semitic of course it is yeah yeah. Anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-white, anti-male, anti-patriarchal system, anti-family. I mean, anti-Christian. Anti-Christian. I mean, yeah. I, I don't understand how people aren't screaming from the top of their lungs. We don't want this in our schools because they're not told what it consists of. Because the media is just carrying the water for the left. And it's interesting, though. The Bible says at the time of the end, there'll be two people groups that'll be persecuted: Christians and Jews. 80% of the religious persecution today comes against Bible-believing Christians around the world. And again, I always like to bring up the point. This was mentioned 2,000 years ago, assuming there would be Christians and Jews at the time of the end. And lo and behold, there are, just like the Bible says. And we are the two persecuted groups right now in the entire world. And the critical race theory, the CRT, and all that, as you do so eloquently explain to people, is something that is so anti-everything, you know, mm -hmm. that we stand for in this country, that the Bible stands for. But people seem to have the proverbial blinder over their eyes, don't they? They just don't get it. Right, right. Well, I, I, I've talked about, excuse me, excuse me, uh, I've talked about the idea of progressive prophetic revelation, how God kind of unveils his, his story, shows us what he's doing. Yep. And um, I, I believe that, um, that supernatural work of delusion that God is going to allow, because people reject him, yep. and we've been rejecting him. We talk about this a lot. We've rejected him on every single level. Um, even, even the church, we're rejecting him within the church and turning back to the philosophy of man. We're starting to see people be delusional, and these aren't, some of these people, they're not idiots. Yep. You know, they're, they're well-educated and thinking themselves wise. They've become fools. Yeah, and the, the terrible thing too, Tim, as you know, there's so many people from our group, evangelical Christians now, who are embracing this sort of nonsense. And that's the really, really sad thing. Uh, there was a study done a couple weeks ago that said only like 20 to 29, at most 29% of young evangelicals support the state of Israel. They really believe that God has a plan for them in the future. And that's, that's on the church for not teaching. And so it's terrible. But it's what's expected in the last times. Isaiah 520, they're going to call good evil, evil good. Paul told Timothy, they're going to oppose that which is good, Voila, here we are in 2021 seeing it. Right. Yeah, oh, it, it, it breaks my heart for this community. My parents moved us out here back in the mid-'80s, and this whole region for a long time has been known as the Bible Belt of mm -hmm. California. You know, and it, it really was. I mean, we yeah. had churches on every corner. I mean, this, and 
great churches, Bible. Yeah. We had so many Calvary chapels in the yeah. area, and, uh, and like real, real Calvary chapels, real ones, real yeah. ones, teaching the Word of God and teaching prophecy and and doing doing what you're supposed to do as a pastor. And, and it's been a great experience for me growing up here. Now I've raised up my kids. Now I'm expecting grandkids. Like I'm, I want this community to be solid. And I've watched as as time has gone by, I've watched the critical race theory creep into the church, um, and, and churches are, are woke now. They, you know, these pastors are, are teaching this stuff as though it's gospel, yeah. and it's, it's a weird thing to watch, but, but you know, we, we know, it, this just proves, again, that Scripture's right. People were, they're not going to endure sound doctrine. No, but what's interesting, like what we've seen here, the growth of your church, what's the percentage that's grown in the last couple of years? 500 percent. 500 percent. There's a reason for that, because this man's preaching the gospel, telling the truth. I've been recently, John Randall's church, Calvary San Juan Capistrano, it reminds me of the Jesus movement, revival going on there, bursting at the seams. James Cadiz at Calvary Chapel, Signal Hill, again, bursting at the seams. Uh, Joe Pettick at Calvary Chapel of the Harbor in Sunset Beach, bursting at the seams. They don't have enough room to put all the people. Why? Jack Hibbs, because they're preaching the gospel, and people want to hear it. They're responding to it, where these other churches are closing their doors, or going woke. Right. Uh, God's people are going the right direction. Right. right. <clears throat> um, an article came out from the Jerusalem Post uh, talking about the Iranian media and, and how they're publishing this look at Israeli's air defense systems. And what they're asserting is that Israel is showing vulner vulnerabilities. So do you think that we're going to, is there some sort of eminent attack that, that could happen with, with that? Because they're being pretty public about it. Yeah, here's the thing. You have to remember about the Middle East. Uh, weakness is, is very much frowned upon. Uh, James Cadiz and I do a radio program called Countdown to Eternity. And he's, you know, he's from Egypt. You know, he's Egyptian. He's first generation of his family come to, and born in America. And he says, he says, we by nature are loud. We are loud, and, and that is respected there. We're, we yell at each other because that's our culture. But when sh someone shows a sign of weakness like Israel has done just recently, yeah, they will pounce on that, and they will test them. So that will not be surprising if something happens, particularly if a new government does come in this Sunday. Because watch, because right away they're going to get a test. Hamas uh, from the Gaza Strip has said it's our, God has told us that the leader of Hamas said to bomb Tel Aviv to destroy it. And you've got Iran, which is behind all of this. So, uh, yeah, it is not looking good for Israel, and particularly if they don't have a strong leader like Benjamin Netanyahu to, you know, to carry the ship. Because when you have a coalition of people, you know, uh, from the left and from the right uh, that basically disagree on everything, and yet they're supposed to bring a unity government? <laughs> I'm sorry, but the test will probably come very soon. Now, one of the interesting things, too, is Ezekiel 38, I'm sure we'll get to that. That, that is going to be a ground war, boots on the ground. Uh, not so much a missile war that's going back and forth. So there may be something that precedes that in some type of limited um, war, you know, regional war that will set the stage for uh, either the Iron Dome that Israel spent a billion dollars on to shoot down the missiles, that the missiles don't work, they can't get through there. So they just have to overwhelm them with people, Tim, as you know that. The Bible says that. It says, actually, if you look at from the sky at the ground, you can't see the ground because there's so many people there they are going to be invading. So uh, the stage is being set. It's really, really never a dull moment here. Right. Oh, yeah. And so let me, let me ask you this. We had um, Dr. Hillel Newman on mm -hmm. the program a few weeks ago um, talking to the Israeli consul general, for those of you that don't know. Um, and I asked him this question. I want to ask you the same question. He obviously, he's a diplomat. And he has to answer diplomatically. <laughs> we understand that. Yeah. Um, we don't. You yeah, and I, you yeah, and we I don't have do. to. No, so, we don't have to. Yeah, do so that. I want to I get your take on this. Um, and I think it's probably going to be very similar to mine. But um, how did the Biden administration do at handling this most recent? You mean you know, on a scale of one to 10? Yeah. Oh, they were. Can you go below zero? <laughs> no, they did, they did horribly because Biden and his ilk never once mentioned the fact the name of. Hamas or Islamic Jihad who was sending the rockets over, they made a moral equivalency of both sides. Now remember, 
Hamas in their charter calls for the destruction of Israel. They sent over 4,000 rockets to Israel, killed 12 people. They would have killed many more if not for this Iron Dome system, again, that cost a billion dollars. And yet there was a moral equivalency made by the Biden administration, by people, you know, and also, too, the sad thing, there's a number of people in Congress who came out of the closet as just anti-Israel, basically saying the state of Israel shouldn't exist, they're an apartheid state, this and that. And instead of being shouted down by their fellow Democrats, what happened, they did a vote. And the vote was, you know, not a single Democrat voted against uh, having Hamas being sanctioned and people who, groups that, uh, you know, give weapons to Hamas being sanctioned for what they're doing right now and actually holding back the money given to Israel that they promised for some of the weapons. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 still in the Bible. God said, I'm going to bless those that bless and curse those that curse. And um, how we treat Israel is going to mean how we're going forward as a nation. So it's a worrisome thing, Tim. The United States of America, they have not been supportive of Israel. It's kind of like Obama, all talk but no backup. And it's very, very sad. So we're going to, you know, we could go all night just talking about what they're doing wrong. But the sad thing is, it's going to affect the outcome of what's going on in our country. We expect that from Scripture. We're not surprised by this. We are brokenhearted because of it. But yeah, they have done an absolutely horrific job. And this new government now, because they don't have any leadership because of the leftists there, they'll have to kowtow to what Biden says, immediately try and get a, you know, the two-state solution, get the people back to the, you know, the, the discussion table and start figuring out where they're going to divide everything. Realize uh, in the past, two different times, the Palestinian Authority was offered about 96% of everything they wanted, wouldn't even return the call. No, we want everything, meaning the whole land. Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, has a map in his office. It says, Palestine, one country. And he says, when we have the land of Palestine ours, not one Jew will live in it. Isn't that something? Yeah. As opposed to, let me tell you one quick story, too. This, this, I had to educate people on this. As a guy a couple weeks ago, I had to tell this at Capistrano, was some leftist guy. And I'm glad he got to hear the meeting. But anyway, he, he was talking about Israel stealing the lands. In the 1948 war, War of Independence of Israel, there were five Arab cities that were there on the way to Tel Aviv. People from four of the cities left. The one city, the people there decided to stay with Israel. It's called Abu Ghosh. Abu Ghosh is the city. The Arabs there decided to stay. Today, Abu Ghosh is called the city of millionaires. Why? Because they're part of a democracy. They worked hard there. In fact, when we take trips to Israel, the last meal we have is at an Arab restaurant in Abu Ghosh, okay? Because they stayed there and they, they uh, you know, basically assimilated with the country. But, you know, unfortunately now they talk about the two-state solution, this and that. Uh, it's just not going to go, not going to work. Right. Um, you, you talk about the Democrats uh, coming out of Congress opposing yeah. uh, Israel. We, we know many of them as the Jihad Squad. Yeah, exactly. And um, there are Democrats in Congress that are supportive oh, yes. of Israel. There are indeed. Um, but my question for, for all of them is where is the outcry yeah. when you have, I mean, imagine a, a group of Republican uh, yeah. members of Congress. They come up and they go, you know what? Chinese people don't ex they don't deserve to exist. We <laughs> yeah. need to just wipe out China, get rid of all Chinese people because they're filthy. Can you imagine yeah. if... Yeah. That happened. If, if a group of where the other Republican leaders, I would hope, would say, "Who do you guys think you are? You're not. We're kicking you out of the Republican Party. Yeah. You're not allowed to be a part of that." Where is the outcry from the Biden administration when you have all of these members of Congress and the Jihad Squad saying what they're saying? This rhetoric is wicked. It is racist to the core. It's it meets the very definition. Of racism. Of course. And they're supposedly so against racism. Why are they not calling this out? That's a great question. Why don't someone ask Chuck Schumer that? He's the Senate majority leader and he's Jewish. Did you hear anything about from him about what Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, or, or former bartender Cortez said during all that time when they were going out? That's the name we give her, by the way, you know, <laughs> just former bartender. It's not meant to be a slight. It's just telling the truth, right? Anyway, um, what... 
no one came to the defense of Israel. There are people, you're right, not every Democrat's anti-Semitic, they're not at all, but they're afraid to speak out against these people. Why? Because the whole Biden administration and Congress is going so left, so woke, that they're afraid to, you know, to step out of line because what's going to happen? Well, they're going to be primaried in the next election. They'll find a different candidate for their, their slot or for the Senate. We'll put someone in that's, that's with us. And they're scared to death, so they're not, they're not speaking out. And that's the short answer there, Tim. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about Ezekiel 38. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do anticipate that that is going to take place. Can you talk to us about the, the players in that and, yeah. and where we're at with those key players right yeah, now? Th this is so fascinating, this whole story. Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about a battle that will take place, or an invasion that will take place. not a battle. There's nothing left when after these nations invade. There'll be seven or eight nations um, that will invade Israel in the last days. Ezekiel 38, 8 twice says at the last days, at the time of the end. So it's not talking about the Babylonian captivity coming back from Babylon. It's talking about the time of the end before God sets up his kingdom. What are given in Ezekiel 38 is the ancient names of the different people groups who will invade. So what we do, we look at the ancient map at Ezekiel's time, and we see these different people groups, and we say, okay, this is modern-day what? Well, Persia is modern-day Iran. It wasn't until 1935 the name was changed anyway, because Iran is the Farsi name for Persia, okay? You've got Betogarma and Gomer. Well, we look on a map of Ezekiel's time, and that is in modern-day Turkey or even Armenia there, you know, where the countries, actually Russia, Turkey, and Iran kind of come together. So it's Turkey there. Rosh uh, is the prince of Rosh, is what he's called in Ezekiel uh, 38, who will be the leader of this. Now, that is a title. Rosh, is, I believe, is a proper noun referring to Russia. Not because it sounds like Russia. Please, please, please. People always make that mistake. It's simply because it's the nation to the farthest north of where Ezekiel prophesied in Babylon or where, um, you know, Israel is. The farthest north, they will come down and he will be the leader of this last day's coalition. Iran, Russia, and Turkey. And interestingly enough, who has been meeting the last several years together? The heads of Iran, Russia, and Turkey, basically being the new sheriffs in the Middle East. Has and that ever happened before? Never. In fact, there's never been a military coalition between where modern-day Russia is and modern-day Iran. Never, no matter what you call the country, ever till today, as the Bible predicted. Now, we've got that together. So basically, they're going to invade from the north, south, east, and west. And that's when God supernaturally intervenes. And so... What's fascinating now, and um, here's what's really incredible. When we would do, you know, I became a Christian in March of 1970. I started teaching a couple years later. When we did Bible prophecy, you know, as you know, you're, I don't want to use the word stuck, but you're forced to go with what the Bible says is going to happen, right? Even though the circumstances <laughs> on the ground may not say that. In the 1970s, you had, again, as you're doing the Ezekiel 38-39, uh, the 1970s, the best friends of of Israel at that time were Iran and Turkey, the best friends in the Middle East. Their mortal enemies were Egypt, Jordan, and the Gulf states. Yet according to Ezekiel 38, 39, Tim, it's got to be just the other way around. And so I remember, you know, people that did these prophetic messages, like, okay, in the last days, this coalition will evade Russia with Iran and Turkey. And people go, Iran and Turkey? Didn't Iran the country that basically facilitated the win, the win in this Yom Kippur War in 1973? If it wasn't for Iran, Israel wouldn't exist? Yeah, that's Turkey. Isn't that where Israel takes their vacations? Aren't they a member of NATO? Isn't Turkey the first Muslim country that accepted the fact that Israel should exist? Yeah. Egypt? Egypt's going to be neutral. Egypt is the one involved in all these wars. What happened? Peace Treaty 1979 in Egypt, 1994 Jordan. Last year with President Trump, you've got the, the normalization with some of the Gulf states. It would have included Saudi Arabia had he been reelected. Well, yeah, he was reelected, but had he been, fair, the votes were fairly counted. And yet, so right now in 2021, the nations are exactly set up just as the Bible predicted, where when we would do these talks in the 70s, everybody was at the wrong place, every single one, but you just give it enough time, right? And God's word comes true. So just give it time. And so here we are. It's a, yeah. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Right. Can you? You can't. right. It's so it, it talks about the hook in the jaw yeah. and dragging in. Now, what do you believe that hook is? <laughs> and do you see that, that act of dragging in at this point. Yeah, the leader Gog, G-O-G, that is a title, like, you know, Pharaoh or Caesar or Grand Poobah or something like that. That is the title of the leader from modern-day Russia. Okay, 
He is going to be the one that forms this coalition, which, by the way, Russia is the only country that speaks to all the nations in the Middle East. The United States doesn't. There's countries that won't talk to us. Russia speaks to everybody. And Netanyahu used to call Vladimir Putin my friend. Well, something is going to cause them to invade, uh, invade Israel with these, these countries. We don't know exactly what it is, but they're going to take something that doesn't belong to them, something they want, but also something they need. Take a spoil, the old King James Version says. And Pastor Chuck Smith said, I think if you take the first two letters off spoil, you'll get the answer. The oil that's there in the Middle East. You know, the, the, we've got the natural gas fields out in the uh, Mediterranean. You've got an oil field possibly in the Golan Heights that is in billions and billions of dollars in value. So there's going to be something there. They're going to get to the place, Tim, where, you know, they're going to feel the need to take on this little tiny country of Israel. Sm so small, you have to write the name out in the Mediterranean Sea. You can't even write it on a map in, the, in Israel because it's so small. It doesn't fit. And they're surrounded by all these nations, yet God is going to fight for them on their side. And at the end, um, they will realize, Ezekiel 39 says, there's a God that exists. So the stage is being set for that right now. It's falling into place incredibly well. There's still a couple things that need to be completed, but it's moving towards that. So uh, again, stay tuned. Right, right. You know, a lot of people look at Israel and they go, my gosh, like, why, why is it so important? Um, it's so small and, and yet it's so argued about. And there's so many fights about this little tiny piece of property, but it's not just a little tiny piece no. of property. It's very strategic. It brings continents together. It's, it's, it, it is very strategic just in that sense, but, but also God's plan for the future and how he's going to rule from there. Uh, will you talk about the, the land itself and why it, the land is so important? Yeah, again, when God called Abram in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, out of the Ur of the Chaldees to a promised land, he promised a land that would belong to his descendants forever. And then he gave them the borders of it. And they've never, actually, the descendants have never taken control of all these borders. But what it is, it's where God has said he has put his name there. Deuteronomy 1.8, when they're about to enter the promised land, it, God emphasized, this is the land I gave to your you know, forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land you're about to enter, the promised land, a land with, with absolute borders, which is interesting too, Tim, as we often mention, the globalist view of the world today, there are no borders. We're all been one happy family, right? Uh, but see, by saying that, you're denying the fact that God said there is a land that he has given to a specific people group that belongs to them in those borders. And so, yeah, Israel, again, is right in the center of things because Israel is God's timepiece. As, as goes Israel, so goes the rest of the world. Right, right. Um, I want to move forward. I got a lot more I want to get through tonight. Okay, sure. Um, coronavirus in Israel. Uh, we're talking a lot lately uh, here at, at 412 Church and on, on our watch um, about traveling, because I do have a trip planned in November. Totally looking forward to getting back. And um, the Jerusalem Post just came out with an article that talks about this pilot program uh, to allow a limited number of tourists traveling in groups into Israel, and that's going to be extended until the end of June, a spokesperson from the uh, tourism ministry said just Monday of this week. They said a decision regarding the entrance of individual tourists, which was expected to be authorized starting from July 1st, will be taken later this month. And you've been there several times. I've been there several times. Um, I I'm sure you've had mostly the experience I've had, which was, man, this is just so peaceful. I always tell people, because people ask, is it dangerous going to, to Israel? And I always jokingly say, it is, but once you fly out of LAX, you're good. No, it's the trip to LAX is the most dangerous right. part. Well, once, yeah, you're, once, once you're flying out, it's true. Yeah, That's you're right. good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, we, we just came through uh, this most recent um, conflict that, that took place there between Hamas and, and Israel. Um, what, what do you say about travel to, to Israel and and where we're headed, especially with, with coronavirus being yeah, a, a okay. reality. All right. I, I've been there 18 times. Uh, the last time was in 2012. I would love to go back again. There was, a, you know, with your compadre, Tom Hughes. I was mm -hmm. supposed to go with Tom in October. And they asked me, um, when was it? Today's what? Wednesday, Monday. Am I going on the trip in October? I said, no, I'm not. And the reason was twofold. Number one, uh, you can't go there right now. The law is unless you've been vaccinated. Sorry, that's not, I'm not going to get back. I've, I've made the choice not to get vaccinated. It's my own personal choice. It's, you know, <laughs> besides the fact I've already had it bad, I've got the antibodies too. But number two, the second thing is, uh, 
I did two flights recently, but one in particular. It's the first time I wore a mask for more than 20 minutes, and it really affected me very, very badly. In other words, I don't do well wearing a mask, all right? And on an 18-hour flight, there is no way on God's green earth I'm going to try and wear a mask for 18 hours because I, you know, it literally, um, I was in pretty bad shape. Just wear that, and again, that's just me. I just don't, I'm one of these people who just don't do well with them. And so um, if they change those two things, I'd love to go. No, I'm not, I'm not afraid. No, I, I think it's the safest place on earth. It's, um, I, but something always happens. Every time I go, something always happens. There's always some incident going on. <laughs> that's all. But what's great about it, you never feel unsafe there. Remember the first time I went was 1976 with Josh McDowell. He was making a movie called More Than a Carpenter. And I went along with him. And it was real interesting. I, was ri- I got to ride on an Israeli bus, okay? I, I can't remember. I was going from the hotel or something to where they were shooting. And th- the, uh, the scene, that is, not shooting one another. Uh, but <laughs> I'll never forget it. There was, I got on this bus, and there's an Israeli soldier sitting next to me. And he puts this machine gun down right between the two of us. And I'm looking, thinking... I'm now in Israel. I'm now, but I felt safe because you know these guys are all armed to the teeth, and so I just felt really good, you know. And but I'd never had that experience before, yeah. sitting next to someone as a machine gun with them on a bus, you know. And but uh, hanging out with the guys from Four Twelve Church. You'll, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I figured. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, but no, it's it's a safe. If you want, you know, let me tell you, there's no other place in the world to, to go if you can possibly go if you can work everything out. There really isn't. Uh, as you know, Tim, um, when you go to Israel the first time, like one of our guides said, you see it with your heart, because it's, it's, this is the place where these events happen. You've read about your entire life. You're walking you know, on the same places where Jesus walked. You go on the Sea of Galilee on a boat there, and you, you know, realize he was on this boat. This is where he walked on water. You go to the Mount of Olives. You realize that's the one that really gets me. You realize when you're standing on the Mount of Olives, somewhere around where you're standing is where he will come back the second time and place his feet there. And if that doesn't get you going, you, we got to check your pulse, you know. And so, um, no, Israel is, is again. There's no place like it on earth. I hope they change their policies because I think eventually they're going to have to because there's a lot of Christians who will not go uh, simply because of the two things. I, well, mostly because of the vaccine. Um, because they, as a nation, probably numer uno with them vaccinating their people on a percentage wise. Right. But the, the point is, you know, now I think if you, if you want to go and if you don't have a problem with the vaccine, you know, and God, that, you know, God bless you. That's just my own personal, you know, uh, opinion there. But also the mask thing is something that's just, I'm not flying anymore uh, unless it's very, very short because it just, it just didn't do me well. Yeah. So just uh, just so you know, I did talk to Dr. Newman, mm-hmm. and I've, every time I talk to him, I ask him about travel. Right. Um, so what, what he's saying right now, right. currently, what they're going to do, because they are, they're leading the world in getting people of vaccinated. They, they expect um, by the time our trip goes that we, they all have 100% right. rate. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and, and I'm sure it'll be well before we go. Um, what he said, the current plan is you go there, and if you don't have the vaccination, they take you immediately from uh, the airport in Tel Aviv to a hospital. They take your blood and they take you back to the hotel room. The next morning, and you have to be quarantined in your hotel room. The next morning they come, if, if you have antibodies, free to go. Hmm. If you don't have antibodies, you've got to stay quarantined for 14 days, and then you're free to go into the country. Well, then the um, trip's over in 14 days. But then the trip's <laughs> over. That's the thing. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've got the antibodies. Same My here. wife yeah. has the antibodies. We're going. So, so long as that's still the, the case, I'm going. I plan on going. Um, and yeah. and I, I'm just having faith that we're going to be able to make it. Well, he's a Paul. It's funny he says that because all the Israeli news outlets say, no, you've got to have, you got to be vaccinated. They're all saying that, every one of yeah. them. They, they yeah, want, and they he says they are saying it, but there's, they're in the fine print. It's kind of like, you know, like Duke University. You have to be vaccinated in the fine print, but we will allow religious exemptions. So well. that's the thing is, like and, and I'm I'm with you on the vaccine. I'm not getting the vaccination. Um, why would I? I've already had it. Same here. Um, but but then also I've got various other religious reasons. I just think it's wrong, especially uh, the use of the aborted fetal cell lines. Uh, in fact, for those of you that don't know, we did create a doctrinal statement against the use of these things. Um, and, and our attorney Bob Tyler, you know, got, went through it all. And we do have a doctrinal statement on our church, on the church, not on our watch, but on the church website. Uh, so if you're looking for a religious exemption for your work, you can go to 412marietta.com. Um, go, go there, go to our statement of faith. I think it's item 17 or 18 on there. And then there's a link to download a religious exemption form. Yeah, um, yeah and, and just to be clear about it, there are, there are, 
there are Christians who do get the vaccine and don't have a problem with it. There's Christian doctors that have told me they don't have a problem with it. So I'm just, again, speaking personally because I have the antibodies, because I've already had it, and because of my age, I think, you know, look, I'm going to just, just I think I'm going to be fine no matter how many more years I have. And, I've, you know, I feel great now. And um, anyway, that's just, again, that's just a personal thing for me. But I'm not trying to push on anybody else. Everybody has to make up their own mind on something like this. And so, you know, God bless you if you feel, well, I know this is the right thing for me to do. And so you, you choose something like this. And what we don't want to do, you don't look down upon someone who's had the vaccine as a Christian. As a Christian, you don't look down on someone who doesn't have it, okay? Everybody has to be persuaded in their own mind on something like this. Right. There's no, I don't think there's a right answer, a Christian answer in this. Sorry. Yeah. Some people do. I don't. Um, I wasn't going to ask you this, but I, I just... Go ahead. I'm going to ask you anyways. Um, I, I personally do not believe that the vaccine or any vaccine in the future is the mark of the beast, personally. Um, but there's a lot of talk about that. And I, I have preached that I believe that the use and the, the almost forcing of this vaccine on people is just conditioning people towards the mark of the beast. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course it is. It's the whole control thing, because one of the things they're doing now is using this. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing this for your own good. And uh, you, you don't want to, you know, spread the uh, Chinese Communist Party coronavirus to anybody else, so you get the vaccine. But no, it's not, obviously, it's not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is a mark that people willingly take on their right hand and forehead. And by doing it, they're worshiping a man who claims to be God. There's nothing that's going on right now is even remotely like that. The final Antichrist, his cohort, the false prophet, will cause the world to take the mark on the right hand of the forehead. You have to worship the beast and his image, or you cannot buy or sell without it. That's the mark of the beast. A vaccine is not the mark of the beast. But what we're seeing, we're not only with the vaccine, but other things too, Tim, as you so often so eloquently tell us, there's so many other things doing to control us right now, isn't there? Right. Not just the vaccine, but so many other things explicitly or implicitly that are taking place. That's why no one from the Democrat Party would speak out seemingly for Israel, because, you know, you say something wrong or something you said 30 years ago in some video. Oh, look what someone said. God, you're gone now, because they got to be so careful of what they say to be politically correct, to use the right pronouns in talking to someone and whatever it might be. And uh, it's, it's, it's horrible, the world we're living in. Uh, we, we used to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, but we're not anymore, we, we, even when we tell the truth. And so one of my favorite verses is Galatians 4.16, where Paul says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, seemingly, we become the enemy of everybody, haven't we, Tim? Because right. we're telling them the truth about what's going on. Right, right, absolutely. Um, let's get into some, so some of you emailed in questions. And if you uh, didn't get... The email that we sent out, so that way you could send in your questions. That just means you're not on our email list. So uh, just a little plug to get on that. Go to rwatchnow.com and connect with us, so that way you can get updates from us. But here are some questions. Um, two two of these questions were, were extremely similar. One from Maribel Sebastian and one from Brittany Greer. So I'm just I just kind of put these two into one question. We'll ask it and then uh, we'll get your take on it. Sure. So uh, they want to know what you think about the rising popularity and acceptance of cryptocurrency, uh, digital currency, and how a universal bankless exchange like crypto plays into end times and whether or not believers should avoid investing in holders like Bitcoin and, and uh, and others. Yeah, again, this remains to be seen what it is. It's We're moving towards that way, because remember, no one can buy or sell without a particular mark on their right hand or forward. There some, seems to be some type of coordinated, organized system where everything is digitized, you know, however it might be, crypto or whatever it will be at the time of the end. We don't know what it's going to be, but the idea is there's some type of database where every transaction made will be in that database. And so instead of carrying cash around, you'll have, you know, some way, to, and a lot of it's done right now, digital, digital money. Tim Cook of Apple said the next generation of kids won't know what money is. They won't know what uh, currency is because everything will be digital. So we're moving that way. So, you know, whether it's the cryptocurrency or whatever, it's going to happen. It's going to come. And again, let people be persuaded in their own mind which what to do on something like that. I don't know that much about it because I just still use the usual deceased presidents. You know, you hand them out, you know, and pay with the green stuff. And so, um, you know, that's that's not really one of my specialties. So I would defer to people who are more into that field. But, you know, it's not something I'm interested in the least in. But we know that's where the world's going. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, here's a question from Peggy Brock. She says, I'd like to know what Don Stewart thinks about Luke chapter 9, verse 27. And uh, she wants to know, what does Jesus mean when he says, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God. Okay, that's How a, would that yeah, be possible? That's easy. Okay. Uh, Matthew 16, 28, the same things there. there. And, uh, and Matthew 17, 1, Jesus said, uh, there's some of you standing here who you know, will see the kingdom of God coming. Uh, this is one of the places, too, Matthew 16, 28, and 17, where the, tra- uh, the people that did the divisions of the Bible, the scripture was not originally divided in chapters and verses. There's a chapter division there. It shouldn't be there. The next verse is the answer. It's a transfiguration. And, that's, and Luke tells us the same thing. About eight days later, what happened? Peter, James, and John, and Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appeared to them, and they saw the kingdom in miniature. Moses the law, Elijah the prophets, and the king there in their midst. And there is the disciples with them. So they didn't taste death, so they they saw a picture of what's coming. That's what it's referring to, the transfiguration of Jesus there that both Matthew and Luke and also Mark records. All right. We've got another question from Peggy Brock. She said, I'd like to know what Don Stewart thinks about um, uh, when God said that humans would only live 120 years after uh, he was disgusted with them and wiped them out with a flood, Then, but, but then Noah's son's descendants live longer than that. Okay. It says, it doesn't say exactly that. When you read it carefully, it says the time is going to be 120 years. There's two ways of looking at that. 120 years from the time Noah and his family built the ark in his driveway before the flood came. So there was a time of 120 years of, of, you know, kind of where God gave the chance for people to believe. Or the 120 years would now be the the lifespan, the end of where the the end, the highest end of the lifespan of people living at that time. Because in Genesis chapter five, you've got these ten different patriarchs who had a, an average lifespan of something like 915 years. Adam, Methuselah, etc. But what's interesting? Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, how old was he when he died? 120 years of age. So what's happening after the flood, the lifespans went down. That's, what, that's all it's saying there. So you, one of those two answers works. Either the time after that was given till the time the flood came, or the, the lifespans are going to go. And they went down precipitously, too, after the flood from, you know, the 969 years in Methuselah to Moses, 120 at the end of his life. All right. So uh, Kim Mungaro, she says, I'd like to know what Don Stewart thinks about where our world is at currently and the direction it's heading. Where do you think we are prophetically according to the Bible, in particular, the rapture of the church? Well, here's the thing. You know, the Bible tells us what the world's going to look like at the time of the end, and the stage is pretty much basically set for all the things to take place. Now, these things that are going to take place are during this final seven-year period before the Lord returns. That hadn't even started yet. But what we do see now is the stage being set for all of these. The players are in place. Now, does that mean that it'll happen overnight? No. Does that mean it happens next year? Not necessarily. We don't know. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Now, we see this, the times and the seasons being set. But the thing we do not want to do is limit God and say, God must do this. God must do that. He must come back in a certain period of time. He must, you know, um, return by such and such a day. Sorry. Jesus made it really clear. Nobody knows the day or the hour of his return. Nobody means you. It means me. It means all of us. We just don't know. God hasn't boxed himself in, Tim. Some people say that. Think God has boxed himself in as saying, I have to come back by this certain year or that year. Uh Uh-uh. Nope. It's it's his call. So we have to be ready at at any particular time. Uh, Just for the sake of people who are here tonight that might not know, or maybe somebody who's tuning online that doesn't know, we, we talk about rapture. What, what is the rapture and what, what are we waiting for? Okay. The rapture of the church is an event that's going to take place according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15. Am I hearing things? Please. Okay. Anyway. Is that me? I'm hearing something right here. We making some noise up here? Okay. Okay, anyway. Right. I, I thought, okay, I thought it was maybe my microphone. I'm moving here on the thing, so I, I'll, I'll try and stay still. Okay, the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. John 14, 1 to 3. All right, here's what's going to happen. At some time, the living believers in Jesus Christ 
will be caught up, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, to meet the Lord in the air. That's where we get the word rapture from. That's the word that's used there in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Now, right before that, the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, the dead in Christ who are in the presence of the Lord, who have no physical, corporeal form now, the bodies and the spirits will be joined together. At the same time, those who are alive are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And as they're caught up, they will be transformed. They will be changed from mortal to immortal, from um, a glorified, uh, from a mortal body and from a corruptible body, incorruptible. Again, uh, on our website, educatingourworld.com, I've got two books on the rapture. You can download them for free. One's called The Rapture, very you know clever title I came up with. The other's called The pre That Greg Lori told me that. Don, how did you get that title? We must have thought for hours. Uh, and the other's called The Pre-Trib Rapture Defended. So I, I talk about that. And so, again, that material is there. Uh, with respect to the signs of the end, the book I've written called 25 Signs, We're Near the End. It's also a free download on educatingourworld.com. You, know, you can buy the book if you want to, but you don't have to. You can, all of our books are available for free, free download. You can print them out, five audio books. The, the, uh, 61 books, if you print them all out, you can, you'll get 13,000 pages of material. And you're welcome to do it. I know people would have done that. but uh, So it's all there. That's our ministry, what we're doing with our... Uh, uh, you know, to get the gospel out to the entire world. So the rapture is the event that takes place where all of a sudden, in the blinking of an eye, as quick as you can blink, people are gone, and they're con caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and they're changed as they're being caught up. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to it. You're looking forward to it. Um, I hope you are all looking forward to it. Um, but there are a lot of pastors who aren't even talking about it anymore. Yep. And so, so there's two, two people asked this question, different, uh, different fashions. Uh, Simon asked, what do you think about the growing number of pastors that are avoiding teaching prophecy? And Kathleen Unsel asked, I would like to know what Don Stewart thinks about watching and seeing many of his fellow brothers in the Lord and pastors that he has served with in ministry fall into the woke ideologies that have led to uh, conforming to the pattern of the world. And I think, I think those two, personally, that's why I put these together, I think the lack of teaching prophecy has led into the woke ideologies. But, so that's why I put those together. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no, exactly right. Uh, Paul told the Ephesian elders, he thought he had, there in Book of Acts, chapter 20, thought he'd seen him for the last time. He says, to teach the whole counsel of God. Uh, Jude tells us the faith has been once and for all delivered to the saints, and the faith consists of predictions about the future, about God predicting, telling us what's going to happen in the future. And so that's part of the biblical teaching. Uh, Jesus pointed to that. You remember when he said, if you don't believe me, believe the very works that I do. What works is he doing? The works that are prophesying the Messiah. Isaiah 35, 5, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised. And the point is, Tim, about, it depends on how it's calculated. Some people said like almost 30% of Scripture is prophetic, talking in the sense it's talking about events still to come. Many of them have been fulfilled. Many are still to be fulfilled. I don't understand why someone wouldn't talk about these things. To me, it's the most exciting thing going, because here we are in 2021, we're seeing the nations line up precisely how the Bible said they would be at the time of the end, how the nation of Israel supernaturally still exists in these last days, how prophecy after prophecy is being fulfilled, setting the stage of who's on what side. Like I said, with Ezekiel 38, 39 scenario, you can't literally make this stuff up if for some reason people won't teach us, which I cannot in my wildest imagination comprehend why, because to me it's the most exciting thing going, because this gets people excited, because how can you argue with something like that? This was written, Ezekiel 37 through 39 was written, you know, 2,600 years ago, and it tells us precisely what the time of the end is going to look like, and that's what we see right now. I mean, come on. And so I don't, I don't get it. I really don't understand why they don't do this. Um, I've got some ideas, of course. They don't want to be, you know, unfortunately, there's a, a kook fringe out there that goes so, f that, you know, Christ is coming back this date, he's going to do this, and this sign in heaven is a sign of Christ coming. And it's all nonsense, but they get the publicity, and they say, well, I don't want to be limited, you know, looked upon like this lunatic fringe. I'm, I'm not, I'm going to be teaching the Word of God. Well, if you teach the Word of God, you do it correctly and sanely, that's, and, and prophecy should be taught in a sane manner, but the whole counsel of God should be taught. Right. Um, so what do you think about these pastors? Like, like the question, she says, how do you feel about your fellow you know, people that you used yeah. to minister with 
that have fallen into the woke ideology. Yeah, it breaks my heart. I don't get it because one of the things I was taught from day one, and that is the whole counsel of God. Pastor Chuck Smith went through the, I can't remember how many times he went through it at Calvary Coast Mates on Sunday nights. And I went through it with him about three or four times because every Sunday night I go through like 10 chapters or whatever. So you got an overview of the entire scripture. In fact, when I became a Christian, the first thing I did is start to listen to Through the Bible Radio with J. Vernon McGee three times a day, morning, noon, and night, as he was going through the Bible. And he'd have, you know, if you listen to him, uh, uh, Through the Bible is also, you get free downloads of all J. Vernon's teachings and that. And I remember listening to him at the beginning, going, how does he know all this stuff? How does he figure all this stuff out? Because he's putting it all together. And it was so fascinating to me as you start to see the Bible all come together, how it all makes sense. And why someone wouldn't teach that, it's, it's heartbreaking because if you're, you're, you're told you've got to preach the whole counsel of God, why would you ignore something so important right. as Bible prophecy where Jesus thought it was important, Paul thought it was important, Peter thought it was important. Shouldn't we think it's important too? Right. I think so. Yeah. You know, it's, um, we, we, we look at Daniel's prophecy and we're told that, that as we come into these times that people are going to if they're wicked, they're going to just keep on doing wickedly, and they're not going to understand. And you, you can see that as you talk to a lot of these wicked people. Not, not, I'm not saying the pastors, some of the pastors are wicked, but um, I'm not talking about pastors specifically, but just people in general who are just doing wicked. And, and I've said this before, some of them are very smart, yeah. very intelligent, very well educated, and yet they don't, they don't get it. They don't understand what's going on. But the wise are going to understand. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, as we see these things, we see the countries lining up the way they're lining up. We see the, the culture being conditioned to be controlled and say, yeah, well, Mark, and I just got to worship him. Okay, well, yeah, means I can still buy, I can still take care of me, then yeah. You know, and we can see the culture being driven towards that. We, we get it. You, you get it. That's why you're here on a Wednesday night. That's why you're tuning in to, to hear because you, you're aware. Yeah. And that's, that's a great group of people to belong to. Yep. You know. Um, okay, so uh, Erwin Keller and Tess Keller both asked um, questions regarding textual criticism and textual uh, critics. Mm -hmm. And um, so they, they want to know what you think about those. And then also um, they said, I want to know what you think about Pastor Chuck Smith's teachings on Westcott and Hort and textual criticism versus um, Don's um opposite beliefs. Okay. So talk about that if you would. Okay. Uh, I don't want to put everybody to sleep talking about this theory because it gets rather highbrow. Um, basically, um, I'll try and simplify it as much as I can. When the New Testament, uh, when you have, uh, it was originally written in Greek and the manuscripts that, that, are, that have now come down to us, there's about 5,000 of them since the, uh, before the invention of the printing press. There's, there's basically, and I'm very much simplifying because it's not really that simple, believe me. Uh, there are two schools of thought. Uh, the school, first one school of thought is the older manuscripts, the, the, more, the closer ones to the original, all things being equal, will be better because that, it, you know, as you copy things and recopy, it hadn't been changed. And that was the theory of Westcott and Hort. In 1880, the English Revised Version came out, and it was supposed to be the uh, one that would replace the 1611 King James Version. And what bothered people is because the text read differently in a few places, simply because from 1611, the few manuscripts that Erasmus of Rotterdam, who was, it was in a sense his New Testament, Greek New Testament was the basis of the, uh, of the text at that time, there is about a thousand manuscripts or so that have been discovered by the time of Westcott and Hort over the centuries, and some of them read a little bit differently, like the, uh, the uh, Vaticanus manuscript, the one that was found there called uh, B. Aleph, it's called Codex Sinaiticus, found in the 19th century by a man named Tischendorf that had the entire New Testament and the Old Testament Apocrypha and that in Greek. Uh, and uh, the bottom line is, some of the earlier ones had, a, in some places, a slightly different text. Now, and I want to emphasize slightly different. When you look at the text that, you know, the, the two so-called competing texts, they're 99.5% the same. They really are. Uh, the differences are minuscule. No major doctrine of Scripture, no major uh, command of God how to act is contained in what we call a variant reading. In other words, one manuscript has it and another set doesn't. 
And so Westcott and Hort, when they came out with this, it, it caused a lot of fear because people were used to, you know, reading the King James. Where is this one of our favorite verses of ours? And it's not there. And they would say, well, because they believe the manuscript evidence isn't there for. Well, here we are. That was in 1880. Here we are in, in 2021. It's been 140 years some odd later. And there, you know, there's still good people hold each position, all right? And uh, the idea is, uh, at the end of the day, they all say the same thing. It's the same message. Please, uh, people are making literally a mountain out of a molehill here. Yes, we want to get to the exact text, but we've got to be careful of, you know, excoriating someone that says, well, they're, you know, this demonic text or God only wrote one Bible, things like that. It's not, I'm sorry. It just isn't true. Let me just give you a bit of my background. In 1976, I was able to study at Biola University for an entire year under a, a world-class Greek scholar, Dr. Harry Sturz, uh, in a class in textual criticism. I've never worked so hard in a class and done so much work or learned so much in that class. And since 1976, I've been involved with this whole study of that and understanding. And, and it, you continue to grow about that. So I do know a few things about it. And bottom line is, like I said, when you see a variation in the manuscripts, or your, your Bible says some manuscripts read this, well, some do, you know. And so, again, at the end of the day, it's the same basic story that you have. There's no real difference. So I, I'm saddened that some people feel it's worth, you know, it, you know, they choose this hill to die on. You really should, trust me, at the end of the day. Um, by the way, people say we got to, you know, get the, uh, go back to the King James Version of 1611. <laughs> really, King James Version of 1611 had the Old Testament Apocrypha in it. Should we have that in our Bibles today? Should we read that? They did for the first, uh, until 1629. So, uh, no, we, we, we learned through time. Again, the Bible is very clear. The message is clear. It's been transmitted accurately. There's no reason to worry whatsoever. There are places you can have discussions about, but I, I believe it's literally making the proverbial mountain out of the molehill. And okay. that's just a simplified version of it, okay? All right. Um, we've got time for one final question. We're running out of time. So okay. one final question, and then uh, we'll, I know people want to get to say sure. hello to you afterwards. So um, what is the best way to explain the importance of prophecy to a new believer? Oh, that's a great question. The best way to explain the importance of prophecy. Here's what I would tell everybody. The best way for a new believer to learn the importance of prophecy is learn the whole counsel of God. Start going through the Bible, and you're going to see how important it comes up all the time. Well, you know, in your teaching, when you go through a certain book, Tim, or something like that, how often does something like that come up? Quite often, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you just go through, and th that's what I would tell people to do. Rather than than emphasizing just that or kind of, you know, making this the only thing you're interested in. That's what we don't want to do. We want to learn everything. We want to learn about the person of Christ, the nature of God, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the afterlife. So all those are important. But when you read and study the Bible systematically, you go through it, then Bible prophecy or last day's Bible prophecy will be a very, very important theme that we'll see in Scripture. And again, there are books that are written that are available that talk about that sort of thing. And so um, my, how I learned it is just learning the whole Bible, you know, and then, then it kept coming up, coming up, coming up. So uh, then it started making sense because it all fits. It doesn't sit out by itself. It fits the totality of God's program for the human race. If we understand that, then we'll have a better view of what's, what's going to happen. Amen. Amen. So uh, one more time, if uh, people want to watch your stuff, they can watch it on his channel. Correct. You've got your shows there. And then also you've got your website where all the resources are. What's the website? Educatingourworld.com. There's a little button that says download books. And you can download all 61 of them if you want. You can download the five audio books if you want and have at it. And please shamelessly promote it because people can get it all for free. Amen. Well, Don, thank you so much oh, for coming for out tonight. My, my really pleasure. appreciate you. My pleasure. Um, um, looking forward to having you out again. So okay. thank you. Thank really you appreciate okay. it. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank everybody that, that joined us online. Hope you uh, walk away today uh, feeling smarter and uh, <laughs> knowing more. So that's an awesome thing. Uh, we will have Esther Valdez Clayton on next week. So I uh, hope that you can join us for that. Uh, until then, I pray that you guys have a beautiful, beautiful week in the Lord. God bless you.